particularly good for a Muslim speaker to be introduced by a Catholic speaker. I've got to do my share and reciprocate in some way. As part of my international trips, we have formed over the last couple of years a Christian Muslim solidarity group in Bangalore, India, under the auspices of, the, of His Eminence Archbishop Bernard Karas there. And previously with Cardinal George and most recently with Cardinal Silpage, I have traded messages back and forth and just yesterday with my friends, I have permission from them to convey greetings on behalf of that group and the Archbishop there to you all here and to the entire group here. So I hope that makes up a little bit for that fine job that you did in introducing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as people of faith, this evening we are called to reflect upon the rule of truth. Our responsibility to understand, speak and reflect truth in today's somewhat bewildered society. In current times, we seem to be confronting a radical shift from the legacy of truth as a sustained reality on which societies and I dare say civilizations have been built, nurtured, and maintained. The truth that Voltaire described as, this is the character of truth. It is of all time. It is, of, it is for all men. It has only to show itself to be recognized, and one cannot argue against it. This shift today away from notions of truth as an unwavering reality is reflected in Oxford Dictionary's selection of the 2016 Word of the Year. In the context of Brexit and the US presidential election, their choice was post-truth. Rather than simply referring to the time after a specified situation, as in post-war, the prefix in post-truth has a meaning more like belonging to a time in which the specified concept has become unimportant or irrelevant. Here we are talking, my dear friends, about truth becoming unimportant in social discourse. President Obama noted this in stating that the new media ecosystem means everything is true and nothing is true. And this is amusingly reflected in Humpty Dumpty's pronouncement to Alice. When I use a word, he said, it means just what I choose it to mean, nothing more, nothing less. Today's post-truth mentality has engulfed society to a degree where truth has become whatever one decides. Backed by so-called alternate facts, there is a movement, especially in political discourse, to mold truth to suit personal agendas. Today we face an assault on that, that truth which Horace Mann showed us as a path to greatness when he said, if any man seeks for greatness, let him forget greatness and ask for truth and he will find both. Today, under siege is that truth which Justice Holmes described as truth is tough. It will not break like a bubble at a touch. Nay, you may kick it about all day, like a football, and it will be round and full at evening. From the religious viewpoint then, we must understand that absolute truth is related to being part of the divine. Perfect knowledge of all truth, about all things, omniscience, is regarded by major faiths. You've heard from the wonderful talk of Dr. Barrett here especially the Abrahamic religions, as a core attribute of the Divine Lord. Truth is most often understood to mean being in accord with fact or reality, or fidelity to an original standard, an idea of truth to self, or authenticity. There is the understanding that truth is linked to reality and the true existence of something. In early Islamic philosophy, Avicenna, Ibn Sina, defined truth in his Seminal work, Kitab al Shifa, the book of healing, as what corresponds in the mind to what is outside it. And for Thomas Aquinas, and I dare say I, you would know much more about this than I do, Dr. Barrett, you're writing a book literally on this theology there. But Aquinas said that the truth of the whole of human intellect is based on the truth in things. And as he elegantly restated Aristotle's view in his Soma, Truth, he said, is the conformity of the intellect to the things. And then Nietzsche, 
rounds off this belief in the divinity of truth perfectly. He says it is still a metaphysical faith on which our faith in science rests. That even we knowers of today, we godless anti-metaphysicians still take our fire too from the flame lit by the thousand year old faith. That God is truth, that truth is divine. Allow me to cover the Islamic perspective on truth right now. In the Quran, Allah, the exalted states, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu ittaqullah wa kunu ma'as salihin. Or you who believe, have fear of God and be among the truthful. Truthfulness is described as a core prescription for a believer to attain the pleasure and the love of Allah. God has made clear in the Quran that telling the truth is a way for attaining success and salvation on the day of judgment. The Quran confirms this is the day when the truthful shall benefit from their truthfulness. Qad Allah, hadha yawmu yanfa'u as-salihina sidhukum. This is the day when the truthful shall benefit from their truthfulness. For them are gardens beneath which rivers flow, wherein they shall abide forever and ever. God well pleased with them, and they well pleased with him. This is the magnificent triumph. That it will follow the Adeem. We are repeatedly reminded in the Quran that truthfulness is an essential attribute, particularly being an attribute of every prophet who graced the earth. And mentioned in the book Abraham, the Quran says, Waskur fil kitabi Ibrahim, inna hukana siddiqan nabiyya. Surely he was a most truthful prophet. And mentioned in the book Ishmael, surely he was a man true to his word. Inna hukana sadiq and he was a messenger, a prophet. And mentioned in the book, Enoch, surely he was a truthful prophet. We also read in the Quran how a man incarcerated alongside the prophet Joseph addresses him, Yusuf, you has Siddiq. Oh Joseph, oh most truthful one. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was also declared truthful in the words of the Lord, the Messiah son of Mary. The Quran says his mother was a truthful one. Muslims are particularly reminded of the Prophet Muhammad in the peace and blessings of the Lord be upon him of his high virtue on truth. Khadija, the Prophet's wife, addressed the Prophet once saying, I swear by Allah that he will never disgrace you for you are kind to your kit and kin and you speak only the truth. Islam teaches that truthfulness is far more than bearing an honest tongue. Exactly the message that you can make up there. We are advised that truthfulness is the conformity of the outer with the inner, the action with the intention, the speech with belief, and the practice with the preaching. Hence, truthfulness is the very cornerstone of the upright Muslim's character and the springboard for her or his virtuous deeds. The Quran says the believers are but those people who believe in God and His Messenger without ever feeling doubt thereafter and strive with their souls and possessions in the way of, the God, of God. Those are the ones who are the truthful. And truthfulness then requires recognizing the truth and then striving on the path of truth with actions in furtherance of the truth. Being truthful requires honesty and sincerity in words and deeds in all situations. In the Islamic tradition, truthfulness is completed when the believer becomes truthful toward his Lord and his Prophet, truthful to himself and truthful to society. Being truthful towards Allah, the Almighty, demands firm obedience to God, being conscious of Him privately and openly and always acting with mind and body, responding to pleasing Him. Being truthful toward His messenger, may the peace and blessings of the Lord be upon Him, demands understanding, following, and emulating Him. Being truthful towards oneself demands constant introspection and continuing self-accountability to realizing one's transgressions, one's mistakes, and correcting them. And being truthful towards society demands sincerely being just and fair in all human interactions, 
and being devoted to the well-being of not just oneself, not just one's family, but to all around, mankind and other creation of the Lord. The more one becomes truthful, she becomes more upright and beneficial to family, to neighbors, to community, and to society. By practicing truthfulness then, a person's life is made upright, and due to it, he or she is elevated to praiseworthy ranks in the sight of God, as well as the people on this earth. The prophet said, I order you to be truthful, for indeed truthfulness leads to righteousness. And indeed, righteousness leads to paradise. And he also said, I guarantee a house in the middle of paradise for he who leaves lying. And he qualified that and said, even when he's joking. The, let's not focus, when we focus on truth, let us contrast falsehood as bearing attention. Our faith cautions that falsehood is the antithesis of truth. Just as truthfulness is the very cornerstone of the upright person's character, the springboard for his or her virtuousness, falsehood is its opposite. It is the foundation of a person's depravity and the launch pad for his or her wickedness. Just as the truthfulness of a person starts from within, that is, it is a reflection of a state of true faith, a person's lying, dishonesty, and deceit are also a reflection of the inner state. And that is why God mentions truthfulness as being the opposite of hypocrisy. That God may reward the truthfulness for their truthful for their truthfulness and punish the hypocrites if he wills. Telling the truth then is a key for all doors of goodness that may lead to paradise. And lying and faith, we are told, can never exist together in the heart of a true believer. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, The complete believer may have any characteristic in his nature except lying and treachery. And the Islamic tradition has strong commandments against lying. Aisha, the beloved wife of the Prophet, mentioned once that there was no trait more abhorrent to the messenger of God than lying. And the Prophet's closest friend, his immediate temporal successor, Abu Bakr, himself referred to by the Prophet as a siddiq the truthful one, because of the truthfulness of his faith. He said, beware of lying, for lying opposes faith. And lying is listed as a key trait of that most wretched of conditions, hypocrisy. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, the signs of the hypocrite are three. When he speaks, he lies. When he makes an oath, he breaks it. And when he's entrusted with something, he betrays that trust. The Prophet also said, beware of lying, for lying leads to sin, and sin leads to the fire. Falsehood is brought up as a particular caution in our social and business dealings. We find the Prophet saying, if two parties in trade are truthful and transparent, their transaction will be blessed. But if they lie and conceal, the blessings of their transaction will be eradicated. I'm sure all of us have faced these dilemmas, and I can tell you, based on my international business practices, I cannot tell you how often I rub up against this admonition, and I'm concerned that people in business somehow do not seem to adhere to this. Islam also mercifully educates us to the dangers of that which even indirectly leads to lying. Again, from Aisha, the wife of the Prophet. May the Lord shower his mercy upon her. The Prophet, the blessing, the, may the peace and blessings of the Lord be upon him. He would often invoke his Lord in prayer, saying, O oh God, I seek refuge from you, from all sins, and from being in debt. When his wife questioned him, why do you appear so concerned about being in debt? The Prophet said, if a person is in debt, he tells lies when he speaks and breaks his promises when he promises. So my dear friends, today then, as believers, as the faithful, we are under strong obligations to search for, to recognize, to reflect upon, and to act upon the truth. In the context of the truth which binds us together in our ongoing Muslim Christian solidarity, we remain inspired by our shared values. And we remain strengthened by our bonds of 
of genuine fraternity. Most importantly, we must and we will, God willing, continue to reflect that truth in actions by working together for peace, justice, and respect for the dignity and rights of every human and for the world we share. One illustrative truth that I'll touch upon before I conclude, which demands our action, is the global ecological crisis that is highlighted by His Eminence Pope Francis in his encyclical Laudato Si on care for our common home, where he advises us that what we need is education, spiritual openness, and a global ecological conversion. And Cardinal Torrent best targeted this truth in his recent message from the PCID when he said, as believers, our relationship with God should be increasingly shown in the way we relate to the world around us. Our vocation to be guardians of God's handiwork is not optional, nor is it tangential to our religious commitment as Christians and Muslims. It is an essential part of it. Our actions, my dear friends, are demanded in reflecting this truth about care for our shared planet. And there are so many other shared truths that we should be acting upon. So as I conclude, let us recommit ourselves to understanding that we have much to do together in both speaking and reflecting these truths. And I'm concluding in a minute because the time for sunset today is 29. So we have about seven or eight minutes left, but I have just two minutes to conclude. <clears throat> Let us be sure that we sincerely recognize these truths and the actions that are required from us for the common good, common good of society. Fighting the scourge of radicalization, and violent extremism in our communities and our youth. Uplifting the poor, the oppressed minorities and the disadvantaged. Countering crimes and drug addiction, especially amongst our youth. Strengthening the institution of family. Protecting our physical environment from pollution. Promoting social justice for all. And acting together against religious, sectarian, and ethnic prejudices, discriminations, and conflicts. Let me emphasize, my friends, as I end, these are not just social, economic, and political issues. And we cannot just let these be covered by politicians and governments while subject to deceptions of alternate facts, of fake news, and of corrosive spin. Instead, as people of faith, we must recognize these concerns as part of universal truths forming the ethical, moral, and indeed the spiritual fabric of a religiously informed society and its concerned and guided citizens, that is us. May the Lord inspire us to recognize, to speak up, and to act upon these truths in concrete actions as part of our shared spirituality. Amen. Amen. Coverage here, the Urdu Times and Pakistan Times, the phenomenal job that you do in going around and covering community events and upstreaming them. We cannot be thankful enough to you. And thanks again to all of you for a fantastic job for the volunteers.